Well, good evening to you. I want to welcome you to uh, Course BI 439. Uh, this is our study in Hebrews, and it will be a two-semester course, um, 439A and 439B. If you have your syllabus, I'd like for you to take it and uh, go through it with me. I want to just uh, point out a couple of things. Uh, we have two textbooks that we're going to be using. Uh, this is called Letter to the Hebrews. It's by Peter O'Brien. Um, you only have to read this semester. You only have to read from chapter 1 through chapter 6. Uh, you pick up 7 through 13 in the next session. And then this is a two-volume set by Kent Hughes. I think you will really enjoy this particular book. Kent Hughes is a very good writer. This, is, uh, uh, this book is very easy easy to read. You can get these off of uh, CBD, uh, Lifeway would have these, would have these books. Uh, if you have any question, uh, any difficulty in actually getting the books, uh, please let me know and we'll see what we can do for you. I think the school could order those and uh, send them to you if that was absolutely necessary. Uh, and I want to say, uh, just in relationship to the books, uh, I am not going to follow uh, this would be the primary text, the one by Brian, but I'm not going to follow the, uh, this in any way. Um, uh, the study that I'm going to give you is, is really just my own personal study, and uh, it, it doesn't follow the textbook in any way. So I want to give you some more just uh, general academic information relative to Hebrews, and uh, the books are there for your reading. You can see all the other things that we have in the syllabus, the course grading. Uh, you'll find that uh, for your grade, uh, it's, it's going to be broken down into, into four areas, uh, two writing assignments, a mid-semester exam, and a final exam. And each one of those are worth 25% of, of your grade. I will send, after, when I grade the paper, I will send you a course grade notification uh, it has uh, five different areas in it, uh, syntax, grammar, composition, uh, just general, uh, uh, your, your following instructions, all those kind of things. And what we will do is that I will send that out to you and your grade will, will be identified on that. I will comment uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on your essay. I uh, give you a lot of comments. I write a lot. Uh, I will grade you if you when you send me an electronic form of your of your essay. I will I will do an electronic notes on your essay so that you can uh, so that you can keep those and it'd be easy for me to send them back to you. Um, what I would like for you to do uh, is to uh, read through the course writing assignments and there's one area in there that I feel like you have to really pay attention to, it's the area on plagiarism. Um, plagiarism is a very, very serious um, kind of uh, academic crime, if you want to call it that, and I want you to make sure that you are not uh, uh, plagiarizing. Uh, I've underlined here, I think in, under item C, that if the student quotes directly or paraphrases, Another person's uh, work or ideas, that quote or paraphrase has to be for, formally documented in accordance with, with MLA. And I do want to say that uh, even though uh, I, I think that the syllabus uh, wants you to uh, use the MLA format in writing your papers, it's okay with me uh, if you use a Turabian or one of the other it, it, the, the format is really not that critical to me. I think it's just the one that Covington has used over the years. But if you change it, if it's easier for you on your computer to use a, a different style, uh, Turabian is what most people would use where you just uh, have uh, a footnote. I mean, you have a note and then you have uh, the end notes at the end. It's, it's more than okay with me. Now, what I want to talk about relative to plagiarism is simply the fact that there are some things that I don't consider to be plagiarism. If, let's say for instance, uh, an author makes a statement that is, is an obvious statement. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say that an author says, well, 
this particular word is used uh, five times in chapter four. Well, that's an obvious statement that anybody could 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 uh, could note. Uh, you could note it. I could note it. Uh, and and if you quote that, that's not that, that's not in my mind considered to be plagiarism. Plagiarism would be when you when you take somebody else's idea, you take their insight into a passage and you don't give them credit for it. Uh, I have a thesis that I'm working on now, just a, another doctoral thesis, and, and I probably uh, have almost a hundred references in that thesis. And so probably every third or fourth sentence in it is, uh, has a footnote to it. Um, where I've used other people's ideas and their and their comments, and uh, and and I'm very careful to to give them credit for their ideas that weren't my ideas. However, that doesn't mean that if you use their idea that you have to necessarily um, you have to necessarily give them credit for that. If the idea that they are presenting is not it's it's not an idea that is unique to them. Uh, if you went through, for instance, and you were doing using word studies, I think that what you would find is that is that all of the all of the Greek scholars, whether it be Wrens or Vines or Strongs or Zodiates or whoever it may be, that they all say the same thing. They all say uh, what the meaning of the word is. There are a lot of times when vines will qu quote Strong's. Uh, Zodiates, for instance, will use vines and Strong's in his definition. He doesn't give them credit because that's just simply the meaning of the word. It's not like a nuance or a, a, a special meaning of the word that this particular author has, has been able to, to understand and, and to document. So I'm not going to hold you... Uh, uh, in in uh, plagiarism, if I if I considered that what you were what you were quoting was uh, was was just kind of common information that all, anybody that would be reading this passage would would come to that conclusion. So that gives you a little bit of uh, uh, freedom there, a little bit of flexibility, and and please use it. Uh, if you look at item D under number five, this is one of my fetishes, and I hope that you will appreciate it, is that you are writing a formal document. You are not, this is not a conversation that you and I are having. This, this is not just some ca casual meeting that we have. We're sitting in at a table, you know, uh, drinking some coffee, eating a donut, and we're talking about uh, Hebrews. This is a formal research document, and the whole point of the of, of writing the essay is what I want you to do is I want you to do the research. I want you to take the time, make the effort, find some other books. You only have to have five. You can use either one of the textbooks if you like, but you cannot use them as a reference. Uh, they don't count toward the five references that you have. And uh, you can use something off the internet, doesn't matter to me. There's a wonderful website. Um, uh, uh, called Precept Austin that you can go to. It has a lot of technical information on it, word studies, uh, uses multiple authors, and you can use that. A um, uh, lot of different resources. But what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to be using a lot of personal pronouns. I, we, uh, me, uh, us, those kind of things, because this is a formal document. It is not an informal document, and I want you to appreciate that. It takes a lot of my time to grade a paper. It takes, uh, uh, there's sometimes when I get papers from students, and it may take me three or four hours. Uh, that's a lot of time, and, and the more students I have, the more laborious that becomes. So I don't want to be having to make comments uh, over and over and over again. If, if you are a first-time student with me, uh, I, I will, I'm more interested in your improvement from one essay to the next. In other words, let's say, for instance, you take both courses. You take 469A and 469B, 
and I make a lot of comments on your first essay, I, it's my expectation that you are going to very, uh, you're, gonna, you're going to incorporate those comments into your next essay, and then whatever comments I make on that, when you take the second part of the, uh, of the course, you would, you would uh, incorporate those comments as well. So by the time you get to the fourth essay, Hopefully, I'm not, I'm not making the same re remarks over, over and over. You can see there the topics for the course writing assignment, um, and uh, if you have any questions about that, you can certainly, um, you can uh, uh, email me. I've got my email there on the first sheet. Uh, you can call me if you want to. I'm normally at home. That's where I study. We'll have a, uh, the, the mid-semester exam will be based on, on this book by O'Brien and, and the final exam will be based on the book by William, I mean by Kent Hughes. And they will be taken chronologically. In other words, I'll start, I'll start at the introduction, chapter one, chapter two, everything will be taken chronologically. And uh, so I'm not trying to make it difficult. There are no, there will be no, um, there will be no uh, trick questions on it. I'm not trying to fool you. Uh, some of the questions may, may be to, to try to help you think through something, but there, there are no trick questions that are on it. And I've got some, uh, some general observations about, about uh, that you can read there about, about your essays and things. If you look on the last page there, it has to do with the class lectures. Um, you can see that we have five, five lessons on just the introduction to Hebrews. Um, uh, to me, that's, that's an important statement that I'm trying to make to you, that there's probably a great deal of what I would consider to be a misunderstanding, not that I have all the answers, but there certainly is a misunderstanding about Hebrews a lot, a lot of it, the majority of it, is related to the warnings that that the author gives, uh, based on whether you how you count. It could be either five or six. I believe that there basically are six warnings, all the way through. It's a very pastoral document, and we'll talk about that because it, it impacts it impacts how you approach the document. Um, I'm going to try to get through the first six chapters. If for some reason we don't get through the first six chapters, uh, we will pick up there uh, in, in the next semester. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 I'll just pick up where I left off. And uh, I think you'll find that when we get to the second semester that Hebrews chapter 9 it's probably one of the most, I would consider it along with Romans chapter 8 to be the two most important critical chapters in all of the Word of God. Um, and it's important that you understand that going in, that this is a very doctrinal book. It's a very theological book. It is from chapter 1 all the way through, midway through chapter 12, so for 11 and a half chapters of the 13 chapters, it's all doctrine. And, uh, and so, in fact, it actually begins a little bit differently than a lot of other books do, uh, New Testament books. It doesn't really have much of an introduction, who he's writing to, any of that. And we'll cover a lot of that here as we go through in the introduction. So, uh, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not going to get in a hurry. Uh, this is a very important book, and I, I hope that as we migrate through all of this that you will appreciate that and understand it. I do want to say that uh, in the recording of this class that uh, I have uh, one of our students from um, uh, our local extension here in uh, South Carolina and uh, 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 his name is William Eves and I've, if William wants to ask questions during the recording uh, he's more than welcome to do that if I feel like it's a question that's going to take a lot of time or uh, to, to uh, to answer, we may, we may actually um, uh, just forego that. I may just say, well, we'll, we'll talk about that after class today and, or tonight. And so, 
Um, but he may be asking questions. I think you'll be able to hear those. I'll try to repeat the questions. Uh, William is uh, one of my excellent students. Uh, he's, he's an A student, writes outstanding papers. He was the first person that I ever gave a 100 on, on an essay. That was very, very unusual. And I think he's done that twice, maybe. Uh, so uh, he's uh, just one of my excellent student, one of our excellent students. And I'm, I'm, uh, he lives down the road from our church where I record here. And uh, he's going to be participating in the class. Once again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to. Uh, you can call me. You can send me an email. I'll be glad. I'll be glad to uh, help you in any way that I can. Now, I'd like, uh, we'd like to begin here on, um, uh, in the introduction here, if you've got your notes, please, uh, uh, please open those. I want to say, if you've never taken a course under me, I follow my notes. Some of you may say, well, I can just read these, why do I have to listen to him? Um, and uh, one of the things that's, uh, that you're going to be uh, at the end of the semester uh, on the Moodle program, uh, I'll have a place there to where you're going to have to indicate to me whether or not you have listened to all of the lectures. Uh, this is not, um, uh, I'm not going to give you the option to not listen to the lectures and just take the test and write the essay. Uh, you're not going to get credit for the course. I'm not going to give credit for the course if you don't listen to the essays and do the reading assignments. Obviously, let's just say, for instance, there was one of them that you couldn't listen to. Uh, I would, uh, your grade would be lowered in some way. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, please, uh, I expect you to be honest. Uh, it's very unfortunate to me that over the years of teaching at Covington that I've had uh, a number of students that have been dishonest in, you know, in saying, well, I, 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 read, I read the assignments that you gave, and then they, they didn't read the assignments, and their intention was that they were going to read them a little bit later, you know, after the class, well, and they uh, always seem to feel guilty about it, and, and they'll come back to me and say, uh, Pastor Gary, I, I just, uh, I, I put down, I was thinking that I was going to do that, and I didn't. I just got back from Romania uh, a week ago, uh, where, uh, where I head up the school there, and uh, one of my students there came up to me and told me that he wasn't finished with the reading of the, of the, of the uh, text that we had, and he wanted to know if, if he could finish reading it by the end of that week, and I said, yes, uh, that'd be okay with me. They normally have to turn their assignments in uh, at the beginning of class just to even be able to attend class. And uh, but by the end of the week, he hadn't he had not finished reading it. Uh, he just got distracted during the evenings. We have long days, uh, tw ten hours of teaching, and start at eight and get through at seven and at night. And he was just tired. And, but I appreciated that when he uh, turned his paper in at the end of the week that he he put that he had not finished the reading. And uh, I will take off. Uh, I consider this to be a part of the course requirements. If you don't read the book, uh, I'm not going to give you credit for the course. So, and you know, somebody's going to say, "Well, that's a lot of reading." It's not a lot of reading at all. Uh, just these two books. Uh, there's only probably 250 pages that you have to read. Uh, here, it's actually less than 250 pages. We have 10 weeks at 70 days of class. If you just read five pages a day or 10 pages a day, you'd be through with it in, in, in a month rather than the 10 weeks. So it's, it's very easy to read. Uh, so uh, you may, somebody may say, well, I'm taking some other courses. Well, uh, uh, you're just going to have to work through that. Uh, I do expect you to do the reading, and I expect you to take... The, the class. Uh, I didn't. The reason I'm going over this is because in uh, one of the other classes, uh, one of the other video classes, I met with one of my students, and uh, and uh, just in the conversation, he communicates to me that he had only listened to about half of the videos. That he worked um, 
he had shift work and uh, it was just very difficult and he just didn't have the time. So all he did was take the test and, and uh, do the essays. Uh, and I had a word with him uh, that uh, that wasn't appropriate and uh, in any other course that he took that he was going to have to take all of the classes. So my expectation is that you will. I'm going to ask you whether or not you have and I certainly uh, uh, expect you to be honest. I have a little sign at my house that says uh, uh, a little saying that I came across one time when somebody said where they had put this at the end of the test and it said, uh, today you're taking uh, two, two, t uh, two exams. You're taking the regular exam, then you're taking an exam in honesty. And uh, uh, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about integrity and being honest. And if you don't have integrity, you don't need to be in the ministry. It's just that simple. Uh, it's not a reproof or a correction. It's just the truth. Uh, so I expect you to be honest. I think there are students that will take advantage of that sometimes unfortunately and uh, so just please make sure that you you do the work now as we begin Hebrews I have to say that uh, along with Romans these are my two favorite books uh, uh, in all of the scriptures uh, there are several issues that I want us to talk about several issues I think that uh, that we at least have to mention and I'm going to take a good deal of time in these introductory sessions. Uh, the first is that the author is not actually known. There are, I, I was reading one commentary, and I, and I do want to say, uh, outside of the introductory information, that probably the, I, I have not used the commentaries for the teaching material. Uh, uh, I don't use the commentaries until after I have completed all of my own personal study. But historically, there are things that I don't know, and I have to use that uh, initially in the introductory material. And so it's really interesting to me the wide diversity of opinion that exists in the commentaries on who actually wrote Hebrews. And I want to say to you right up front, right here at the very beginning, is that nobody knows. Uh, you don't need to make too big of an issue of this. I'm not going to make a big issue of it. And I'm not going to make a big issue of it simply because God didn't tell us who wrote Hebrews. Uh, we know that Paul wrote this and Paul wrote that. And we know that who he wrote to, he wrote to Timothy and he wrote to Titus on, the, on Crete. We know that John wrote the book of you know, Revelation and the Gospel of John. All of those kind of things are very clear to us. When we get to Hebrews, there is no place in all of this and it doesn't matter to me what kind of linguistic style uh, somebody has well this is similar to what Paul did or this is similar to what uh, uh, somebody else did it, it, it doesn't matter we don't know who the author is and there's no need in our trying to surmise and try to identify who the author is I was uh, um, if you went over to Hebrews chapter 13, just to give you an example of how, how people, um, how they kind of come up with ideas about this, uh, there are a lot of people that when we finally get to Hebrews 13 that believe that it's so different from the rest of the book that, that it's, it's an addendum that somebody has attached to the original author's letter, uh, letter or sermon. And uh, some people believe, based on verse 23, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, that that means that Paul, because Timothy was Paul's protege, he was his disciple for nearly 15 years before he took over the church there at Ephesus. So they think, for whatever reason, that, well, Paul at least added this addendum here. Uh, he didn't think there were enough exhortations throughout um, and so he was just adding chapter 13 and attaching it, and so he got multiple authors. All of that is very, very frivolous in my mind uh, because the scriptures just simply did not identify anything like that. We just simply do not know who the author is, and we don't want to spend a lot of time. There are a lot of speculations as to who it is. I read one commentary and it, that had listed some 14 individuals hmm some 14 individuals that it possibly could be. Well, what does possibly do for us? It doesn't really do anything for us in 
the exegesis of this passage. And if God had wanted the author's identity to be known, then he would have, he would have told us. So it's sort of a rule that uh, you ought to have that if God doesn't give you that information, he didn't care, it, it, you don't need to speculate on it a lot. In fact, I would say that just if we just take the Hebrews 13 passage again, that in a lot of seminaries, uh, and I know this is a fact, that there have been a lot of theses that have been written on, on uh, the fact that Hebrews has two authors to it, just based on Hebrews chapter 13. And it's nothing but speculation. It is, it is purely speculation. It's very presumptuous. The Bible says that ultimately that presumption leads to sin. And the best thing that we can do is just to, just to take the information that God uses, that God gives to us and not go beyond that. Not try to speculate and to say, well, it, you know, it, 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 there probably is another author or it, it was uh, uh, somebody else that wrote this. Um, uh, I just think that we're way outside the boundaries of what, of what God is, of would, would, where he would want us to be. If God wanted us to give us the information, he, and he, he would have chosen to do so, and he would have given that to, to us. So for that very simple reason, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I, I'm, we're just going to simply leave it at that. There, there are no references. Uh, secondly, there are no references to Gentiles in, in the book of Hebrews. That does not mean that there is no application to the Gentiles. Us, obviously. Um, uh, for for there, there certainly is. I, I say that, I say that just for the simple fact that there are some uh, expositors, some, some theologians, scholars, whatever you want to call them, people teaching at different seminaries that uh, are very dispensational in their theology and so they would actually say because there are no real uh, uh, it, it doesn't appear that there's anything here to Hebrews to, to the Hebrews that I mean to the Gentiles but that it that the book's not even applicable to to the Gentile church uh, I find that to be really really difficult to even consider to even think about because uh, this, uh, I mean, the Bible was written to Christians. It wasn't written to non-Christians, and it wasn't just written to Hebrew Christians. And so, um, uh, what it does mean is that I think that we, what we ought to take from that is that the major emphasis of the book of uh, of this book is to the Hebrews during their during all the difficulties and all the trials that they were going through. We'll go over all of that as we go through this introduction. So it's written to uh, Jewish uh, believers, most likely in a predominantly Jewish congregation. I'd say many of the letters of the New Testament are written that way. Uh, if you went to the book of James, for instance, it's to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, to the diaspora, that are out there. So obviously, obviously, he's writing to the to the to those Jewish tribes that have been scattered after the persecution. James was the first uh, book that was uh, written in the New Testament, uh, and so obviously he has a primary uh, kind of uh, uh, Jewish audience. But um, and uh, so we know here. In this book, that these uh, Hebrews were going through a great deal of persecution. If you were to turn in your Bibles to uh, uh, say to uh, Hebrews chapter ten, it talks about in verse uh, thirty-three, actually verse thirty-two, about how you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and uh, you became companions of those who were so treated. Uh, this guy, you, you had compassion on me in my chain. So obviously, the, the guy that was writing this was at, had been a prisoner at some time. That's why he might say, say in verse thirteen, in in chapter thirteen of uh, in verse three, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. 
because he was with them, apparently. This, uh, this was probably a pastor, um, and uh, they, they, for you had compassion on me and my chains, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and more enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So obviously they were going through a tremendous degree of, of uh, persecution. Uh, they got de-synagogued. Part of being de-synagogued de means that the Hebrews would not, if, if you work somewhere or if you, they wouldn't buy anything from you, they wouldn't uh, uh, support you in any way. So being de-synagogued is a lot more than just not being able to go to church on Sunday. It's where you become ostracized by the community. Uh, you basically lose your job if you're, if you're working for somebody else. It was very, very serious. And obviously this had happened to a lot of this, this Jewish congregation here. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the expectation was really, really high that at some point that Christ was going to return fairly soon. But obviously that did not take place. It says... There, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So my point is, is that at this time, they, a lot of these Hebrews had thought that Christ was going to return. He had ascended up into heaven, and he was going to come back. Uh, There's some places... Uh, in some of the writings of Paul, where he almost gives that kind of mindset, where he, he is expecting the Lord to come and to come fairly quickly, and he doesn't. And Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So this letter was written probably, uh, we, we know that it occurred before the destruction of Jerusalem. There's no mention about the temple being destroyed or Jerusalem being destroyed. Most people believe that it was written 65, 68 AD, somewhere around there. And that's, that's very significant because if you just think, they are almost 35 years down the road from the time that Christ had been crucified and ascended into heaven, and they're expecting him. They have this high expectation that he's going to come back and he doesn't come back. And there is this, there is this uh, expectation, and it doesn't get fulfilled. Their hope gets kind of deferred. It makes their heart sick. And, and you can just understand that they're, going th they're being persecuted. They know what's happening in Rome, where uh, Christians are being, uh, use, being impaled, on, used as torches, uh, uh, I mean, there was just so much that was taking place around them. And, and it, it, you, it can just imagine what it would be like if that had been, had been you. And so they, what they had hoped for had not really materialized. And then to make it worse, to make everything a lot worse on these Hebrews, on these Jewish Christians, all of the Hebrews, all of the traditional Hebrews had turned against them and had ostracized them and and so their faith in Christ had just led to deeper and uh, continued persecution. Thirdly, it's assumed that the letter was written before 70 A.D. I think that's a very accurate assessment here. Um, just because these things I mentioned earlier were, were, not, were not mentioned in the letter. I, I mean, you can just imagine what the destruction of Jerusalem would be to the mind of a Jew. And so there obviously was a, um, uh, that obviously had not happened. You, you, you would just assume, I'm making an assumption, you would just assume that the author would have mentioned that. They may not even have seen that coming. I, I don't think that they probably did. Fourthly, there are a number of excellent theologians who approached the letter, and, and I have to say that for me personally, uh, you can evaluate it however you want to, that this is a very, very big issue. This is not some minor issue that I'm going to mention here. Probably, I would consider that one of the most prominent theologians that would uh, take the position that we're going to talk about here would be 
somebody like John MacArthur. I'm not saying, I, I shouldn't probably even use his name. I don't think I've used his name in the, in the notes there uh, because I respect him uh, deeply. Um, and, uh, I mean, he's a great theologian, a wonderful Bible teacher. I, 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 don't, I don't want to uh, in any way demean what he has what he has communicated, but I do have to say that based on what I'm going to share with you that I am in disagreement with somebody like him. And he's not the only one. There, there, there are others who have taken the position that, that the letter was written to three basic groups of individuals. I want to say, and I want to just make this as a sort of a blanket statement that covers everything that we're going to talk about here, is that the New Testament is written to believers. It's not written to unbelievers. It's written to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Corinth. It's writ written to Philemon, who is a brother in the Lord. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it, it's written uh, to the seven churches in Revelation. You, you know, it's, it's, it's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It, it's written to believers. It's not written to unbelievers. Does it have application to unbelievers? Absolutely, and we have to be careful. I mean, we have to be discerning as to how to apply what's being written to the believe, uh, to unbelievers. But I, I want to. You can look there in the notes here at the three different uh, basic groups that of individuals that some theologians, and I say excellent theologians. Uh, say that the book is written to, they say it's written to Jewish believers. That would be obvious, I think. I don't think there would be any argument about that at all. It's written to Jewish unbelievers who were intellectually convinced of the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ, but they were unwilling to commit themselves to them. They were the ones that would want to go back into, they, they would be, the Judaizers. They would be the people that would want you to be circumcised, that you to keep the Sabbath day, to keep all the laws and the regulations and all of that, all of those kind of things. Uh, if you went back to Acts chapter 15 and you read what the council there in Jerusalem, I think it's Acts 15, what the council at Jerusalem came up with, yeah, that's where it is, that, you know, they just came up with three or four things, uh, you know, keep yourself from sexual immorality and fornication and don't take things that are strangled with, you know, they've been strangled, don't, don't eat the blood, they just kind of health things. Good, good, good advice, you know, good advice. Not, it wasn't kind of the law that you had to do that, but they were just giving good instruction and good encouragement to the people. And then the third group here is Jewish unbelievers who were not convinced. So, you got, you've got, you've got these three groups, and so when you come to a very difficult passage, and I want to say that the difficult passages in Hebrews, all of them relate to the warnings, the five or the six warnings that the author is is going to give to us. He's going to begin there in chapter two, and then he's going to end up in chapter uh, twelve, uh, I think verse twenty-five. With the warning, I think the stiffest warning, the the most cr crucial warning, occurs in Hebrews chapter ten, and then what we're going to find is that when we get to those warnings, they're all based around the little word if, and I want to say this up front that the little word if doesn't even it's not even in the Greek text. It it comes out of the verb. Uh, it comes out of the tense of the. The, the verb. There are whole, there are whole uh, denominations that are built around the five or six warnings in Hebrews, uh, and they use, they use these warnings as the basis for their theology that, uh, and that a Christian can lose their salvation. So if we don't get the warnings correct, if somehow we misinterpret the warnings and we don't get them correct, then we are in trouble to begin with. And so what some authors have done is that they have just said, well, that, that passage of Scripture is talking to this group, to group three or to group two, uh, but not to group one. And I want to say to you that there's no place in this letter, I would challenge that, 
uh, adamantly. There's no place, there's not one single place where, where the author, the person that's writing it, says that. It just simply does not happen. It's just not there. So somebody is making an assumption. And in my mind, that assumption is wrong. And what it does is it takes sort of the sting out of the warning. In other words, it would be like, it would be like, it, it, it would be like the warning doesn't have any application to you. It's written to somebody else. And I want to say up front that the warnings are written to you. They're written to me. They're, they are warnings. God is saying that there's something to lose here. It's not that you lose your salvation, but you certainly lose something. And we'll talk about the warnings here in great detail uh, as, we, as we make our way through here in the introduction. And uh, so if you make that kind of distinction, um, it, it allows some of the authors, uh, the commentators who've taken this approach, um, they will take a particular warning and they will assign that to one of these three groups. And you, if you don't, you can go through, you can take, you can go through and read some commentaries if you want to, and see how this is kind of a prevalent view. And I and I want I want to make an issue of this, and I want to make an issue of this up up front. There's some rules in hermeneutics that I I, I just want to. Uh, this is not a course on hermeneutics, but I, it's important because we, we want to know if, if I have a goal as somebody that's teaching you, uh, you're, you're a student, one of those goals is that I want you to handle the scriptures carefully. You can't be frivolous in any way with how it is that you're going to hand it, uh, uh, handle or manage the scriptures. Uh, your ministry is based on how well you handle the scriptures. Uh, none of us are right about in everything. I mean, we're sinners and, and we just, I'm not right about everything. Uh, you're not going to be right about everything. But you still have to make good judgments. You have to handle the word of God carefully. One of the, one of the uh, rules in hermeneutics is that, is that without context, there is no text. In other words, what that rule is saying is that if you get the context wrong in which the scriptures are being written, if you don't understand the context, then you cannot come up with the right meaning of the text. Some people would say it like this, without, without proper context, the text just becomes a pretext. That's the way that some of the hermeneutical authors or teachers would say it. In other words... You don't really have the text. Uh, a good example of that, for instance, would be in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, you're all familiar with the verse where it says, uh, where two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Well, you'll hear that uh, sometimes at the end of a service or at the beginning of a service. Lord, we're here today. We're, we're here to worship you. And you've told us that we're two or three more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst of them. Well, that may be true. But it's not true based on the context of Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is talking about a brother that's been taken in sin. You go to him in private. He doesn't receive your encouragement or your, your correction. So it says you take two or three of you that go to him and, and you approach him again. And if he doesn't receive you, then you bring it before the whole church. And then, So he says there... In that context where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. So what he's talking about is two or three people going to correct a brother who has been overtaken in a fault, been overtaken in a sin. And he says, if, if y'all go, you go with the right attitude. If you go properly to correct him, uh, they're witnesses to all of this, I'm going to be there with you. It doesn't mean the other thing. So in essence, if you're just... If you're just kind of praying that in your prayer or say that in your message somehow, you've got that passage in the wrong context. So without context, there is no text, or the text becomes just a pretext. And, uh, and if, if, if you don't get it right, if you don't get the context right, then in essence you can't get the meaning right. 
And so we have to be very, very careful with these warnings. Uh, we have to put them into the context that the writer is writing uh, to, to this uh, small congregation or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it's the intent, it's my intent, okay, that I'm going to uh, write from the perspective that all of the warnings all of them are ap applicable to all believers. They're beneficial for all believers. And hopefully by the end of this study, you will be convinced that that's true. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to teach to persuade. And I, I hope that you do that as a pastor that that's, or as a teacher, whatever it may, may be, that you're going to teach to persuade. You ought to be convinced of the things that you're teaching. Um, and to me, this is not a small issue. This is probably the primary issue that's associated with the book of Hebrews. And we'll discuss this in a lot greater detail as we go through the study. Um, there's a great book. I've listed it here in the notes for you. It's a book by Thomas Schreiner. It's uh, called The Race Set Before Us. And it has to do with not just the warnings in Hebrews, but it has to do with all of the warnings in scripture and how to handle those warnings if if there's been any book that has kind of helped me and influenced me it's this book by by thomas schreiner i think that uh, mr schreiner is a professor of uh at southern theology uh, 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 the southern southern baptist theological seminary up in louisville uh, and this, he's written this book in conjunction with one of the other professors there. It's an excellent, excellent book. It's, for me, it's a must in anybody's library. But he writes, he says, uh, he, he, he writes this concerning the warnings. He says, we make our case that they function as a necessary means for believers to persevere unto final salvation. In other words, all of the warnings are applicable and they have great benefit to the believer, they're written there for a reason. If I'm riding down the road and I come to, if I'm in the mountains and uh, I'm up on the Blue Ridge Parkway and I'm going around and, and they've got, they, you know, some places they've got the guardrail and other places they don't have the guardrail and I see a sign up there. I don't go fast. I don't ever drive fast. And I, I see a sign up there and it says 25 miles per hour and it's got a sharp curve. That warning is not given to hurt me. That warning is not just for, for, just for people that are going fast. It's for, any, it's for everybody to be careful that there is, there's some danger up here and you need to be aware of that and you need to appreciate and to understand that if you go 85 around this curve, you're going to run off the side of the mountain or run into the guardrail. So these warnings are given to benefit. I like I like. I like the 55 mile an hour speed sign or the 70 miles on the on the interstate. Uh, I like I like I like slow down, danger ahead, and so that's what the author is doing. And if the liberty is taken to assign a warning to the unbelievers in the second and third groups, uh, then for all practical purposes, the warnings don't have any benefit for me. In other words, it's like saying, well. Hey, all of this other stuff is for you as a Christian, but this warning is for you as a non-Christian. Non well, the non-Christians aren't even reading the text. They're not reading this letter. And it's not just giving this to the Christians so that they can give it to the non-Christians. It's written to believers. And these are some significant Hebrew believers in this book. Fifthly, it's important to understand and appreciate that Hebrews is a very pastoral document it's a it's a doc, it's a document where the author has a tremendous heart for his people he he's hurting his people are are getting discouraged if if you're a pastor uh, and you have a heart for your people the, the worst thing that 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 can happen is for your people to be discouraged it, it ought to grieve you and to hurt you and in some way. And I, I think the author is not writing or, or warning these Hebrews in some kind of spiritual vacuum. You know, like he's up on his 
theological pedestal and he's just writing and kind of looking at all the things that are going on. Not at all. Uh, it's, uh, he could very well be a pastor, certainly a teacher in some way. Uh, there are a lot of people that just because of uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 22 where he calls it to bear with this uh, word of exhortation, they, they believe that, he, that this is a sermon that he is given to his congregation. Uh, we don't know that. Uh, it's, a, it's an assumption on anybody's part. Uh, we don't know that he's a pastor. What we know is that it's very pastoral in its, in its, in, in its approach and how it communicates to these people. He doesn't just start off with the really strongest warning in, verse, in chapter 2, it, it, you know, just, just you know, coming down with the gavel. It's not that at all. He just sort of works his way through very carefully. He just presents Christ uh, and the high priestly ministry of Christ and that if they're going to make it through these very difficult times, then in reality, they have to understand the high, the, this high priestly ministry of Christ. They have to understand Christ to be able to get, to get through the crisis. And he, he obviously doesn't feel that, he feels like some of them are kind of drifting away from that and they've lost their perspective on, on that part of the Christian life. And so from just a practical perspective here, it appears that these people have become very tired. They've become spiritually exhausted. They have been in the fight. They have been in the battle. You know, it's like watching a football game or something where, you know, it, it's a close game. It's very difficult. And, by, and they get to the fourth, they get down to the fourth quarter, down to the last several minutes, and the teams are just exhausted. And it's like these Christians have become spiritually exhausted. Listen, if you are a pastor, uh, a, a teacher, if you're somebody that's involved in ministry and you've never been spiritually exhausted, then there's something probably wrong in your ministry and in your approach to the ministry. I find that the ministry is extremely exhausting. It's mentally exhausting just to study at a, at a constant rate. You know, for those of us that teach and preach, we don't get a rest. I, you know, Sunday comes around every Sunday. Wednesday comes around every Wednesday. You know, when I'm doing uh, the videos or when I'm going to Romania or Zimbabwe or wherever it may be to teach, uh, in, uh, in a month I will be in Zimbabwe. I will be out in the middle of the bush teaching pastors that all, the only thing that they have is the Bible. They don't have computers. They don't even have electricity. They don't have word search or logos or tools or they don't have Vine's Expository Dictionary. They are men that have nothing but the Word of God. And it's, it's, a, it's a long week. It will be 115 degrees. Uh, uh, when I was there, the last time that I was there, I spent a week after evangelizing for over a week, I spent a week discipling all of those people that we had led to Christ under a tree every day from about 10 o'clock, it took us two hours to get out there, to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, there, there, nothing, there's nothing, there's no water it, we're just under a tree. They're sitting on rocks and sitting on some blankets of some kind. It's exhausting. And if you're going to be a good pastor, you, it takes quite an effort to be prepared for your people emotionally, spiritually, um, intellectually. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is to stand in the pulpit and not be prepared. I would encourage you, if, that, if that's sort of an earmark of your life, you need to find something else to do. Uh, you need to find another occupation. So you ought to be able, I ought to be able, to understand what it means to be extremely exhausted. But these people are not just tired spiritually, they're tired physically because of all of the persecution, the, the, the Hebrews, the Romans, everybody else that's associated with them has made life incredibly difficult for them. This is not like, well, they just get up in the morning, they're going to have a nice 
normal day. They're having trouble just surviving. If you're out in Zimbabwe, say, in the bush, you're going to have trouble just surviving. In, uh, in probably three or four months, uh, uh, I'll be going to the Philippines and to Indonesia to speak uh, to pastors for a week in both of those places. And th w the reason that we have been asked by one of our uh, students who just graduated, a doctoral student, uh, who graduated, uh, met him at graduation, and uh, he, he was just begging us if uh, Dr. Il Defonso and I would come. And uh, just, uh, uh, he said, uh, our, our pastors are so discouraged. It's a primarily uh, Indonesia, especially, is, is um, about 240 million people, and the majority of them, I mean, the vast, vast majority of them are, are Muslim, and, and so the Christians... Are, are they're, they're, they're tired. I mean, they just get persecuted all the time. And, and these people are, are at that place. And you can't ever lose sight of that as you're going through the letter. He's not just talking to somebody that's having kind of a, a small moral issue or somebody that just doesn't understand a passage of Scripture. You know, I was thinking the other day, if you if you're if you're keeping up with the news, how how um, uh, in Iraq, for instance, how ISIS is systematically going through the, the cities, finding those that are people that are Christians, and lining their children up in front of them, and telling them that if they don't denounce Christ and Christianity and take up Islam, that they're going to systematically behead their children, which is what they are doing. Now, you're talking about pressure. We're not just talking about a theological issue here. We're not just talking about somebody having a bad day. We're talking about a parent having to make a choice as to whether or not they're going to follow Christ or they're going to watch their five children have their heads chopped off. I mean, we're talking about something serious. You can't just take your, your few little scriptures and just quote it to somebody in those circumstances. And I think that that's sort of the feeling that we have. That's sort of the content of the circumstances that are surrounding the writing of this letter. It, this, there's tremendous persecution. So if you don't get that, if somehow you miss that, you miss, you miss their context, if you miss the circumstances in which this letter is being written, then you're going to miss the meaning of the letter, and you're going to miss the pastoral aspect of what the author is doing here. So there's this constant struggle that's going on. Thomas Long described it this way. He said that th the threat of this congregation is not that they're charging off in the wrong direction. They do not have enough energy to charge off anywhere. Man, I read that and I just loved it because it really was exactly what I'm trying to communicate. These people are losing heart. They've been, doing, they've been in this for years. This is not just something that sort of happened last week and they had a bad week. They're having a bad life. They're having difficult circumstances. They're struggling. They put food on the table. And so you come to this, you, you come to this letter and if somehow you miss that, you miss the heart of who the pastor is, uh, who this author is actually writing to. It's critical that you see that, that you understand that. They just seem tired, and I think that can be easily understood through all of the immense pressures that they have on them uh, during this time. And the real threat is that they'll just drop their end of the rope and just slowly drift away. They get tired of the, of the daily, daily struggle that they, that they are going through. I was talking recently to uh, one of my uh, former students who is a police officer. And uh, he just said, uh, he's a member of my church, and he said to me, he said, the other day, he said, I just about turned my, my weapons in. He said, we had stopped a car. He, 
it's a stolen car, they've got, it's, uh, they, they have stolen weapons, they're a felon, they had pot, they had cocaine, there was a couple of other things, and, and, and they stopped them, and it was almost a gunfight uh, uh, where they were going to be shot at. They were the ones that were out in the open, and the two men were in the car. And uh, he said, I'm so, and he says, what really upset us is that about three months later is that the solicitor basically took all of those charges. I mean, here's somebody that's stolen a car, they've stolen weapons, they are convicted felons with a weapon, they have cocaine that they're selling, they're distributing drugs, and there are a couple other things, they're resisting arrest. And the solicitor throws all of those charges out with the exception of one. And they get a small $200 fine. Uh, they had to spend 30 days in jail. And, uh, and they're back out on the streets. And he says to me, he says, why do I have to, why, why am I putting my life on the line all the time? You know, the solicitor is not putting his life on the line. They just got a, a, a loaded docket of cases and they're just kind of reading through them and saying, no, we'll throw this one out, no, we'll throw this one out. No. I mean, and I'm out there on the street every single day messing with these crooks and criminals. My life is on the line. Why am I, I mean, people drawing guns on me, why am I doing this? So they can just throw it out. What's happened is that in his mind, after... 30 years of being on the police force, he's losing heart. He's exhausted through the circumstances. And I think that's sort of what we're facing here in Hebrews. And it's very important that we understand that and that we, that we see that. So Hebrews is written by somebody that was very familiar with all the difficulties and all the circumstances that these people were going through and in his kind of, I'll just call it a pastoral role. I don't know that he's a pastor. I think throughout the study, I'll probably refer to him that way. It's an assumption on my part just for, the, just for being able to teach it. Or I, I could just call him the author. But somehow we know that he was personally engaged with these people. He, I mean, if we read chapter 10 there, I mean, uh, yeah, in chapter 10, where he talks about the fact that he was in chains, uh, uh, you had compassion on me in my chains. He understood. He was right there. He, he, this is obviously a very strong Christian. This is somebody that understood the scriptures. This is somebody that understood doctrine. In my mind, this kind of individual had to be around some excellent teachers up to this point. He may have been around Paul. That's why he might mention Timothy. Uh, I mean, it could be Paul. Who knows? I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't even assume that. But I'm just saying that this, this author understands the difficulties and the circumstances that his people are going through. I find it very hard as a pastor to, 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 to preach to people or to teach people that I don't understand their circumstances very well. When I go to uh, Zimbabwe in a month... Uh, I've made the decision that because my students are not going to have anything, this is all I'm taking for a week. The, the only thing that I'm going to use is the Bible. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to take any notes. I'm not going to take anything. If they don't have any notes, I'm not going to go there with all my computer programs and everything that I've got that, that I'm, just, I'm going to teach them as if they have nothing and as if I have nothing and try to teach them how to study the Bible with no tools. And I think that I can do that. I'm excited about it. I have a whole list of things I've written down that I want to talk to them about during that week. It'll be, I probably teach them seven or eight hours a day. And uh, uh, so, it, 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 but they don't have anything. And, and, and I decided I'm not going to go in there like, I have everything and they have nothing. I, I, I would leave and they wouldn't have any tools. They, they wouldn't have anything to work from. So I'm just going to approach it that this is all you got is the Bible. And it's sufficient in and of itself to teach you and, and you can be a great pastor just with the Bible. So I think in order to help these people that he loved, 
what he does is that he attempts to persuade them. He understands the difficulties. He understands their circumstances. And what he wants to do is that he wants to persuade them of the course of action that they need to take. Now, you just have to think about this for a minute. If, if you know, uh, if you, let's say, for instance, that you're a pastor and people come to you, say, for some marriage counseling and you're a good marriage counselor, and they are, I just, I have a, a, a Romanian doctor, a doctoral student that I just uh, finished grading his thesis on. And it, the content was very, very good. It was very good. Um, and, uh, but apparently he's done a lot of marriage counseling over the years. And he had a lot of insight. It's very practical. And, uh, and, and if somebody comes to you and, and they're struggling in their marriage, what you want to do is that you want to give them some steps, some, some, you know, something that they can begin to do and implement in their life that's going to help their marriage get back on track. And these people are discouraged, and so this writer has come to this place where what he wants to do is to give them everything that they need to get back on track. Now, you probably have a lot of people like that in your church. They're off track. I can't tell you why they're off track. They're just off track, and somehow you need to help get them back on track. It won't happen in a week, won't happen in a month. But you've got, to, you've got to persuade them. You've got to teach with conviction and with... Uh, you've, got to, you've got to be correct and accurate in the information that you provide to your people. And so what this letter teaches the Christian is, is really a very simple le lesson. It's the lesson that the problems faced in life can only be met and solved in the person of Christ. Now, you know... Here you are, you're listening to me, and that's a very simple statement. But I'm just going to tell you, that's where we're off track. That's where the church is off track. That's where Christians are off track. It's because we have lost confidence in the person of Christ. We've lost confidence in the Word of God. I, I could just preach here for the next 50 minutes on, on where the church is and how we've lost the truth and where we've lost the truth. You know, pastors have lost the truth because they've made the decision that they are not going to give their people what they want. They're going to get, uh, I mean, what they need. They're going to give their people what they want, what they like to hear. And there's just so many places where the church has gotten off track. You know, we have a lot of churches that have decided that we only need to meet once a week. Well, we've gotten off track. We've lost the truth. We ought to be engaged in the Word of God corporately over uh, on a regular basis. And I would say a lot more than just once a week. I certainly don't want to have your people down there every night. But, but the teaching of the Word is, is very important in, in people's lives. And you as a pastor have got to figure out how to persuade your people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And for some, I know that that statement may just be way too simplistic to satisfy them intellectually. That's, you know, well, all you really need is Christ. Well, I'm not going, as we go through this book, we're going to get right back to this statement over and over and over and over again. You cannot live the Christian life without Christ. You can't be godly without God. You cannot approach the Scriptures uh, uh, casually. They are going to always be driving us back to the person of Christ. And so, for some of these people, they found themselves being persecuted. They were having their goods remu uh, removed. I, I know that just historically, we understand that there were many of them that were actually being killed. And then any frivolous foundation that they may have had about life and how to manage it would just crumble before their eyes. Just think if you were in that situation and you had some kind of philosophical outlook on life. You just, all you had was just some, some philosophy of life that you had developed. You know, here in America, things, it appears that things are going to be, things are going to get much worse before they get much better. 
And, and uh, we could be experiencing a national crisis uh, at some level in, in, in the near future. And, uh, and if your foundation in your life is built on some philosophy about life that you have developed over an extended period of time, when all that comes, you can just crumble. If, if, if everything that you believe, if, if the things that you believe are not solidly based on the Word of God and on the person of Christ, and on the integrity of the scriptures and how they want you to actually live. There's, there's no foundation for life. None. Zero. There's no foundation for your life or my life or anybody else's life apart from the work of Jesus Christ. And this author, from beginning to end, he just starts out in verse 1 of chapter 1. He just drives us to Christ. He just constantly is just driving us to Christ. Just one, one verse after another, just driving us to Christ. Because that's the foundation of the Christian life. When passages, I want you to go to Hebrews, that you can follow them there in the notes in Hebrews chapter 11. When passages like this are read, all of the piety and all of the meaningless philosophical ideas that men have about life and about themselves, they just fade into oblivion and into nothing. I mean, you, you read these, I've read these so many times uh, in, in preparing these lessons and teaching these studies. Um, I, I, you read this kind of stuff, it says others. You know, he had this great chapter on faith and how they had overcome this and overcome that, and then it says, but others. They were tortured. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Probably talking about Isaiah when he was sawn in two by a wooden saw. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, and they were destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. In other words, they're just being hunted down and they have to live in caves and mountains and, and just flee and, and they're being tormented and afflicted. And those are very, very strong words of persecution that the author is using here. Now, as mentioned earlier, there, there's been debates. I, I, I call it debates, whatever you want to as to who the recipients actually are. However, it should be obvious to you and me that these are real flesh and blood people. I mean, these are people that are hurting. These are people that are going through some very, very, uh, very, very difficult circumstances that they were facing. And they were in danger of giving up. Uh, I, you know, I know a lot of professing Christians, I'll use it, I'll say it that way, Probably have a lot of professing Christians in churches that are not really, probably not saved. Uh, they just, but we, there are a lot of there, there are a lot of Christians. They just, they they give up. They, they they some trial in their life, some difficulty in their life. They don't like what's happened. They're discontent with the way God's allowed this to happen in their life. Next thing you know, they're 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 gone. They just they they've gone out the back door, and you don't see them anymore. And these people were being severely tested as to whether or not they were going to maintain their faith in Jesus Christ and to press on into maturity. We'll see that in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And so the writer is faced with a very difficult task of knowing how to encourage them. Now just think about this for a minute. You have to put yourself in his place. If you are pastor and you have any salt about you, any salt in your ministry, if you, there's any integrity about you, you're going to find yourself in this, in this place at some time where you're going to have to find a way to encourage your people to get through some things that may be very, very difficult. I have been preparing my people through the book of Hebrews now for probably a year and a half, um, to prepare for what I think is going to happen 
in the United States in the very near future. I, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a, I believe in the sovereignty of God, and, and uh, I'm, uh, I don't feel afraid about any of this. But I want my people to be prepared. I want them to be prepared mentally and intellectually and spiritually so that when something difficult actually happens, that it doesn't take them off guard, that we've talked about it enough, we've prepared ourselves mentally enough to, to ensure that, that we're not going to be caught off guard by something very difficult that happens. I don't think, I don't think that any believer can cope with the kind of circumstances that these believers found themselves in if they are not rooted and grounded in the person of Christ. Nobody likes to be persecuted. Nobody likes to be afflicted. Nobody likes to be tormented. Nobody likes to have their goods plundered away. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes their families being, being split. And, and, and nobody, is, no, nobody would like any of that. But when those things happen, when those things occur, you have to be rooted and grounded in something. The area that we minister in, in Zimbabwe, for instance, 40 or 50 years ago, I think it was about 40 years ago, when Mugabe went, in, went into um, in, to Zimbabwe, he went up into this region, it's up near Victoria Falls, he went into this region, went out into all the villages and killed all the Christian men, raped the women. So a lot of, all his soldiers raped the women. Um, and so a lot of the children, or, or a lot of the people that are now there, there that may be 40 years old, they are children that were born from all the rapings that went on. And they don't have a, they, they're, 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 uh, the husbands of the wives were killed. I mean, they killed all of the, they killed all of the men. They killed a lot of the women. This went in there with guns and killed them. Because they were Christians. Uh, and so what happened is that there's a, an entire generation that, that's just missing. They had no, they, they took their Bibles away from them. Uh, the majority of them don't have a Bible. They still have their tribal poles in the, in the villages. And, and you can just um, imagine just they, what these people went through. Well, I think that would be similar to what these Hebrews are, are going through. And so to ig ignore all of this, you know, um, I, I think uh, some, of the, some of the commentators, you know, they've listed these various groups that the letter was intended to, and it appears that their purpose in doing all of that is to find a way that they can deal with the difficult passages with the warnings. And, and those warnings, if you're not careful, they can give you the impression that a believer can lose their salvation, which they cannot. And so, for instance, one commentator states that the expository sections of Hebrews were written to both believers and unbelievers, but the warning passages were only addressed to unbelievers. Now, I'm just telling you, that's, that's a dangerous statement to say that, that the warnings were only written to unbelievers, that all the other exposit, you know, all the other passages were written to believers, but the warning passages were only addressed to unbelievers. If that is in fact the case, then the warnings have no significance to me. They don't have any significance to you. You could just take your pencil and just and just strike through them because they don't apply to you. They apply, they apply to somebody else. I'm going to say to you that they apply to you. They apply to me. They are written to me. They are written for me. These warnings and they're very they're very strong. Um, I, that's a very dangerous position to assume. One of the purposes of the warnings is that they are giving, they are given to protect, to protect the individual, to protect the, the believer, to forewarn them of impending danger. 
that they may be facing. And so, in essence, the warnings are at the very core of what Hebrews is about. Let me, let me back up. Let me, let me say that differently. The fundamental teaching of Hebrews is the high priestly ministry of Christ. Without any question, from beginning to end, it's about the person of Christ. And the warnings are... are are strategically placed, they kind of build up, they have a, a sort of a crescendo effect um, from beginning to end, they get stronger as they go along, but they have a very critical, uh, a very critical purpose in the letter. And I would say to you that for some commentaries, the warnings have become the crucial part of the letter, and what has happened is that some of the authors have, have missed what I would consider to be the, the primary intent of the letter, which centers around the person of Christ. But just to ignore the warnings would be to miss and actually negate one of the major intents and purposes of this letter. So within just a very simplified perspective, Hebrews was written to Christians, but it was written to Christians who were going through some very difficult times, they came from a lot of varied backgrounds. We're not just talking about people that came out of Jerusalem. Uh, we're talking about Christians of, uh, of every kind of, uh, of background. I would say that you have to include, you have to, you have to include Gentiles as a part of this. Um, I think it would be erroneous on our part to, to, to only to say that this is just a completely uh, Hebrew congregation or, or Hebrew only Hebrews that the author is actually addressing um, but the letter is, is not addressed to lost people even though some of the readers may obviously be lost rather it's addressed to Hebrew Christians who are going backwards you, I mean, you know do you have anybody like that in your church? Some people that uh, probably have it really good, and they're going backwards. Well, he's writing to he's writing to Christians who have it really bad, and they're going backwards, and that makes it even more difficult in in some cases. And so, everyone knows people like that. Every one of us know people like that. Uh, William here in class, he's a pastor. He he got a great church. He understands that you can. Be, you can have people in, in your congregation that begin well, but then they just don't finish well. Every single one of us have those kind of people in our, in our churches, or we have had those kind of people in our churches. And so outwardly, they, maintain, they may maintain some kind of elementary, uh, maintain the elementary rudiments and basics of the Christian faith and practice such as nominally attending a church, you know, uh, giving some money to the church on a regular basis, uh, having some knowledge of the Bible. But in reality, they have turned their back on, uh, on, on the Christian faith for a life of worldliness and for religious formality. They're just going through the motions. Their Christianity is not real to them. Now listen to me. As we go through this book, if you don't figure that out, if for some reason, somewhere, somehow, you miss the application that has to be to those kind of individuals, then you're just not, you're, you're just not paying attention to what this book is about. Um, every church has had people like this. People who outwardly appeared to have tremendous spiritual potential, but who later begin to slowly, just casually drift away from the faith and from fellowship with God's people. I mean, he gives, as he talks about one of the warnings there, I think it's in Hebrews chapter 10, about, about not forsaking, that's a strong word, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And then they make a deliberate point of rejecting the very faith that they once so vig vigorously confessed and, and defended. So the warnings of Hebrews appear. I want you to look here. You can look in the notes there at the bottom of page 3. There are warnings like 
Do not drift away from what you have heard and been taught. Do not neglect the message of salvation, Hebrews 2, 3. Do not come short of the goal of the Christian faith, Hebrews 4. Do not lose hold of your confession, Hebrews 4. Do not become dull of hearing, Hebrews 5. Do not become sluggish, Hebrews 6. And there, there are many others. And against this backdrop of what we might call a kind of, what, what I've called here a kind of spiritual weariness that exists in these uh, in the audience that the author is writing to, there are those other passages that seem to talk about this kind of permanent and caustic, almost rebellion against the Word of God. For instance, look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Departing. We're not talking about just having, just missing your, your, your Tuesday morning devotions. This is a heart of unbelief. He's writing to believers. Look, at the, look there how he starts it. Beware brethren. Beware brothers. Beware Christians. Beware those of you that call on the name of Christ that there's something in you. There's an evil heart of unbelief and it's going to cause you to depart from the living God. You're going to do something that you know is wrong and not right. Hebrews chapter 6, probably the most difficult verse in the entire letter. It says, uh, for some, the following may be impossible. If they fall away, to renew them again to, to repentance, since they crucify themselves, they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Now, that verse, that one whole section there in Hebrews 6, it's my goal to get through to Hebrews 6 in this, in this study. If I don't, we're going we're gonna to pick it up next semester. That this is, a, this is a critical passage here of how you personally are going to handle the Word of God and how you're going to exegete it. You're going to learn more about how you handle the Word of God and, and just letting the Word of God say what it says here. And it says that it's, uh, for some, it, it starts off in verse 4, it's impossible. Now that's a strong word. And you're going to see, hopefully, that it applies to Christians. It's not a, applying to a non-Christian. It's a word like impossible that makes some of the commentators say, well, this can't be talking to Christians. But he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about being renewed again to repentance where they've, they've fallen away to such a degree and now it's just impossible for them to be renewed to, uh, to, uh, to repentance. And we'll go through that in some, some detail here. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is the most alarming of all of how much worse punishment, verse 29, do you suppose will he be thought worthy who's trampled this? He's talking to Christians here. That's what makes this verse so frightening almost. It's alarming. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant as just a common thing by which he was sanctified, and insulted the Spirit of grace Man, you can't get any stronger than this. There's not any place in all the New Testament. I'm not even sure that Jesus said any words to the Pharisees that were any stronger than this here. And these are, and, and so my point in all of this is that, well, if, 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 if we just take the position that this is not written to us, that this is written to non-Christians, well, we can just ignore these. We can just, we can just cross our arms and just... Just kind of read through it kind of casually and just move on. And I'm going to assert to you that it's written to you. It's written to me. It's written to believers in the church. I, there's not a single believer that can just treat Christ lightly, lightly after having come to a, a knowledge of the truth. Somebody who abandons Christ has no other hope. They literally have no other hope. Notice what it says in verse 26. For if we sin willfully... We, who's he talking about? If you went there in that, in that chapter, and we'll, we'll find this as we go all the way through this, that we're going to find that 
that he's always talking, he's using language that is talking to, to brethren, like in verse 19 of chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, brothers, sisters, you know, he's talking about us, let us, verse 22, let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us consider, let us not forsake, let us exhort one another, for if we, well, who's he talking to? You see, if you, if you just follow the flow of what he is saying there in the beginning of verse 19, there's not a single word there where he's talking to a lost person. He calls them brethren. He calls them we. He identifies them. He says us. And then he gets to verse 26. And there may be a break in your scriptures, but there's no break here in the letter for if we. So he's not just changed his audience and gone to somebody else. He's talking to the same people. He's talking to these believers to draw near, to hold fast, to consider, to not forsake, to exhort one another. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. This is not just some kind of ignorant sin that somebody falls into. This is something that they have done willfully. They have done willfully. I know of a, I know of a couple that has, they claim to be Christians, and yet they are just living willfully in open sin. They live together. They're not married. They don't plan on getting married for probably another year, another year and a half, and they're just living openly in sin. Uh, they used to come... Uh, uh, to my church, and, and when they started living in sin, they stopped coming to church here. I don't know if they go anywhere else. And the reason I'm sure that they stopped is because they knew that if, if we understood that they were living in open sin, that we would confront that, just willfully living in sin. That's a very, very dangerous place. I'm talking about a very dangerous place for somebody to be. And so this is intentional. It's something that these people know that they're doing. And when these kind of passages are examined, any serious exposition must start from the presupposition that the writer knows exactly what it is that he has stated. He knows what he's trying to communicate to his readers. These are some very serious warnings. Every believer has failed. Every believer at some point in their life has been predisposed to do something that they know that they shouldn't have done. I have. I know my wife has, you know. William here in class has. Every single one of us have, have done something that we know that we shouldn't have done. We've been predisposed to do that. But we're not just talking about one isolated event here. We're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about something here where they have, they have reached a place in their life they know what they're doing is not honoring to Christ. It's intentional, and they willfully are going to disobey and live outside of the boundaries of Christ. That, that, there's no wonder why the author spends so much time in Hebrews chapter 11, I mean chapter 12, on God's discipline. If you're his child, it says if, if you don't receive discipline when, you, when this happens in your life, that you're a bastard. You're not one of God's children. Every son that he loves, he disciplines. So if you get outside, if I get outside, we'll say it that way, if I get outside of God's boundaries, and especially if I do it willfully, let's say, for instance, I'll just use a, a very awkward thing. Let's just say that I decided somehow that I was, I was going to have an affair on my wife. I mean, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a long time. I've been a Christian for 43 years. Certainly, Certainly, I know that that's not right. That's not what God wants me to do. And I just said, nope, I'm just going to do that. There are a lot of pastors that have fallen into that sin. And uh, God is going to discipline me. How is he going to discipline me? I don't know. How severe is it going to be? I don't know. He doesn't tell me how it's going to be. What I know is that God is going to discipline me as one of his children. And it could be... It can be very, very severe. This is not me just missing my devotions one morning. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's very serious. We're at kind of the end of this letter here. We're in chapter 10. 
after all of this teaching that he's given on the preeminence of Christ. And so we've all failed, but this, is, this, this has some kind of evil intent to it. This is, this is more than just a simple moment of weakness that a believer has in their life some, somewhere along the way, where they just, you know, just in a moment of weakness, they just did something that they knew they shouldn't have done. This is a strong deliberate, intentional sinning against God. It's a divine of God. It's kind of a fist-in-your-face kind of attitude. No, nope, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, I, I teach and preach just adamantly to my church about you can't just do what you want to do. You can't just say what it is that you want to say. God doesn't give us that option. And there's some people, they just, they're going to speak their mind. They're going to just say what they want to say. They're just going to it doesn't matter where they are. They're going to, if that's what they think, they're going to blurt it out. That's unchristlike. It's unbiblical. I don't have the right to just say whatever I want to say. I have to be discreet. I have to be kind. I have to be tenderhearted. I have to be transparent. But I, I can't just blurt it out. And there are a lot of Christians that do that. Obviously, there are parts of Hebrews that I think make a lot of Christians very uncomfortable. I think uh, anybody w w that was honest that when you read through Hebrews, I, I know, I know when I taught this at my church that uh, there were these there were sections that we we have a we have a um, we have a sort of a habit in our services that I allow the people to ask questions uh, whether I'm preaching on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever it is. Uh, they do it more on probably Wednesday and Sunday night, but uh, they can ask questions uh, uh, and there were just some, there were some places where we would read some of these verses and it made them uncomfortable which is great that was exactly what it was designed designed to do and they would ask me a question about it in in the service and they would become a little unsettled and so the scriptures and the warnings are accomplishing exactly what they need to accomplish they're doing exactly what they need to do they're, 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 they're causing somebody to be a little bit uncomfortable. You're going too fast. The sign says you need to slow down. There's something in your life that you're doing that is inappropriate, that doesn't honor Christ, and God wants you, he wants to draw attention to that in your life. And so uh, these people that he's writing to, they, they had some fundamental issues that the writer felt like he had to address. I would say to you, these are very serious issues that we're going to talk about. They're very, very sober issues. I think that we live in the Laodicean church age, and it's a church age that I think lacks, uh, it, it, it lacks um, a lot, uh, just let me put it that way. And, and, uh, the church is confused about a lot of issues. I think there are a lot of pastors and people that are in ministry that are just completely confused about what the Christian life really is all about. And so these are some very sober issues, and it appears that for many of these people that their faith had become deficient. I would say to you that, that as a Christian that as you grow older, you ought to be more mature. That you ought to find that there are different levels of strength that God is giving to you as you mature in your faith, as you, as you grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There are different areas of your life where you ought to be strengthened, not weakened. Uh, I think there are going to be trials. I think God is going to sovereignly allow there to be trials in, in people's lives. And those trials, those trials are there to build you up in the faith, to edify you, to help you. And obviously these Christians were going through a lot of that and uh, there was a lack of, of steadfastness and perseverance in their life. Uh, there was a lack of progress. For instance, if you go to Hebrews chapter 5, if you'll turn there just a minute, in verse 11 through 14, it indicates that the recipients were not growing in their Christian walk and in their Christian faith. It says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, 
But you, since you have just become dull of hearing, whatever, for whatever reason, these Christians have come to a place where they had become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Now, to me, I, I just want to say that for me, what that's saying is that they have been taught for a long time. I mean, it's not like they've just been a Christian for six months. By this time, they ought to be able to take the Word of God, to disciple somebody, to train people in the ministry. They ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So they've gone from solid food back to milk, is what he's saying here. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now I think that for anybody that is honestly and transparently following Christ, that these warnings, these warnings that are given in in the book of Hebrews, they ought to str strengthen you. They ought to be warnings when you come to them. Let's just take the first one, for instance, where it says, give the earnest heed to the things you've heard, lest you drift away. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You, you ought to be able to say in your life, I'm not drifting here. I'm not drifting in my Christian life. I'm growing in my Christian life. I, I'm falling more and more in love with Jesus every day. I'm being faithful. I love my church. I love my pastor. I love, I love what I'm doing. I love the, the, what God, the, the ministry that God has given to me. I, I love my husband. I love my wife. I love all of that. I'm growing in the faith. I'm spending time in the Word. You ought to be able to say that. You, you ought to be able to say that without any hesitation. The, the people that these warnings are going to make uncomfortable are the people that aren't doing these kind of things. I, I read the warnings and I, I'm not, you know, if I get to the worst one, I, I'm not trampling the Son of God underfoot. I'm not doing it. I, it's just not happening. I mean, I know that I'm not happening. I'm not, I don't count the blood of the covenant just a common thing. You know, it's just not just some something that's just common to me. It's, 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 it's critical to me. It's a vital part of my Christian life. I'm not, I, I, I don't believe that I'm insulting the Spirit of grace. So when I come to that warning, it's not being arrogant on my part. It's like an encouragement to me. It's like, well, hallelujah, yes. Yes, I'm not insulting God's Spirit. Do, are there times in my life when I may do something wrong? Absolutely. And it may be an insult, but it's certainly not a habit of my life. You know, I'm not just, I'm not out there just kind of inappropriate, you know, doing things that are just inappropriate for a Christian. And so what I'm saying is that for somebody that's really following Christ, you get to the warning, you say, well, that's not talking about me. You, it shouldn't be talking about you, right? It shouldn't be talking about you. You shouldn't have an evil heart of unbelief, and right now you're departing from the living God. You probably wouldn't be taking this course if that, if that identified you and identified your life. And so these, these, they're, they're, these, these believers have, have reached a point, some, some of the believers that this writer is writing to, where they, 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 they have drifted. They, have, they are forsaking. They, they, they are insulting the spirit of grace, he, of God. He, he wouldn't be writing that unless that was actually happening to them. Uh, there are obviously areas in every one of our lives where we need improvement. I can guarantee I have plenty of areas that God is working on in my life and needs to work on in my life. And I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I, I, I do not in any way want to, to be a hindrance to, to that part of God's work. I would say, for instance, right now in my life, that probably what I consider to be the primary area that God is working on is that God wants me to be Christ-like. In everything that I do. Well, why does he want me to be Christ-like? Probably because in a lot of areas, I'm not as Christ-like as he would want me to be. But just every day, I mean, this has been going on for months now. Just, Gary, you got to be Christ-like. you got to be Christ-like. You come across something that's difficult. You, you come across some kind of tension, some kind of circumstance. 
you don't want to react, you just want to respond, you want to be kind, uh, you want to be, you know, Acts, uh, I mean, uh, Ephesians 4.32, be tenderhearted, you know, be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, be forgiving, all those kind of things, and you've got to do that. You, you've got to come to that place in your life, and so these people were just drifting, they were rebelling, they were failing to go on into maturity, they were sinning willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth, they were trampling the Son of God underfoot, they were treating the things of God as being uncommon, I, I mean, just being common, you know, just like being your brain, you know, just the Bible, it's just something, it's, it's no big thing, church no big thing, we don't have to be there. They had reached that point in their life, they were insulting the spirit of, of, of grace and the spirit of God in their life. They despised God's chastening, they were refusing God when he spoke to them. They, they whatever was going on, it was not good. And this pastor, this author, has this very pastoral mindset in trying to talk to them and trying to reach them. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, it, it identifies this dilemma. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Look, there's some things in your life you just have to set them aside. You have to let them go. You have to find a way to get those things out of your life. Let's just say, for instance, that you're a man and you're stuck, you're, you're in the ministry and for some reason you're studying, you're struggling with pornography. There are a lot of pastors that struggle with pornography. It's easy to get on the internet. You know, nobody's home and there they are and they're looking at something and they erase their cookies and they do this and they do that. It's amazing to me how many men, how many men in the ministry that I have talked with who are struggling at some point in their life with pornography. You have to lay it aside. You have to get rid of it. You have to do what God wants you to do. I mean, I'm not, you know, the purpose of this this morning, I mean, of this evening is not to talk about how to do that, but it's just something that you have to lay it aside. I mean, that's what he's talking about here. You have to lay it aside, you, and you have to be able to run the race with endurance. You can't do it if you're stumbling over this every week. So, this is a very, very strong letter. It, it has these, these intents moments, you know, he'll be teaching on Christ and all of a sudden you know, get to something and it's just absolutely intense. And we'll find that out when we get to the technical side of the verses of it. And, and I want to say, just I haven't said this, that what we're doing in this study, just because it's, this is, this, is, this really should be a longer study than it is, and I can tell already I'm probably not going to get through, but this is really an overview of Hebrews. Uh, we're going to look at some of the major passages and the problems in it, but it's, we're not, I'm not going to do an exposition of every verse. We just don't have time. It's just, just, we just don't have the time. This is, this is going to be uh, an overview of, of this particular book. And so the writer understands that every Christian has sins in their life that they have to address but is a true Christ-honoring believer just a rebel? And that's the difference here. Um, uh, you know, there are just things in my life I know that God wants to, uh, to, to improve. There are areas that he wants to probably get rid of. But I don't think that I'm a rebel. I, you know, you ought, not, you ought not to think that you're a rebel, that you're just rebelling against God in your life. So rather than discouraging a believer, I think these warning passages should have the very opposite impact on their life. They're, in, they're given to encourage the believer, to strengthen the believer, uh, because he understands that these descriptions do not define their personal spiritual walk. I remember when I was teaching through some of these passages to my church, and, and, uh, and, and every course that I teach at Covington, I, I, I've taught at my church to kind of iron out everything so that I just to work through some of the issues. And I'd get to some of these warnings and I'd say, does that apply to your life? I mean, do you think that this is describing you? You think you're refusing God when he speaks to you? I mean, do you, are, are you insulting the spirit of grace? Uh, I want the answer to be no, that's not talking about me. It shouldn't be talking about you. So you ought not to be afraid of the warnings. If, 
if 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 you're in the mountains on the on the Blue Ridge Parkway, you're not going 85 miles an hour around the curve. So it ought not you ought not to be afraid when you see the warning sign. You ought to say, "Well, good. I'm glad it's there. <laughs> Hallelujah for that." So. I think it would be very difficult from any portion of this letter to come to the conclusion that these people did not understand the spiritual realities of what it really meant to be a Christian, to, of the Christian faith, of all of those realities that uh, were before them, or that they still needed to be persuaded of the, 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 the claims of Christ. The issue was not their salvation. I don't think at any point in this letter with all of these warnings, and I, hopefully this will become clear as we go, more clear as we go through this passage, that the issue is never about their salvation, ever. It's about the fact they've become dull of hearing. It's like they are drifting. It's that they have lost, they, they have lost their, their courage to go forward in the Christian life. And so, from the very start, it becomes apparent that the author was right. You ought to be teachers by this time, right? This is not, this is not the first rodeo. This is not their first message that they have heard. But by this time, by what time? Well, it's 35 years later. You've been a Christian for a long time. And, and, and we know that, that, that being a Christian is... It, I mean, look at what they did to Christ. Look at what they did to all the disciples. They murdered them. They martyred them. They crucified them. They crucified them upside down. This ought not to be, this is not a news flash here that the author is giving. These people should have known by this time. And so obviously, He's writing to people that he really cared about. It's, 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 it's like he knew them intimately and he knew of their struggles. He knew of their failings. He knew of their doubts. He, he knew of some of the issues. You know, they may be in a family where, they, where, they, where, the, where the, the, the family just is discouraged and they got a member of the family that's discouraging them. And, um, and, and he understands all of that, and, and he, he knew their misgivings. And so the writer is writing to encourage them to hold on to their faith in the midst of very, very difficult circumstances and uh, to not let go of those things that have spiritual substance to them and where the blessings of God have been embedded into, into faithfulness and into following, following Christ. So once again, this is a very, very pastoral letter. It's, it's, it's uh, because it's pastoral in nature, it's not written to discourage. You know, um, yesterday at my church, uh, I, I, we, I normally have a PowerPoint that goes along with my message. And uh, I, don't, I don't put the scriptures up there. I might put the scriptural reference, but they got to, I, I make them turn to the scriptures but they, uh, as a part of that, I, I, I didn't use the PowerPoint. And I said, the, the, the reason I'm not going to use the PowerPoint today is because I just want to preach for a little bit. And I just preached, and I preached hard during that, during that message. And, uh, uh, and it, 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 I wasn't preaching to discourage them. I was preaching to encourage them and to build them up. But it was... It, it had a, the message had a, a completely different tone than maybe what it would on a normal Sunday morning. And so, for instance, here in this letter, the five primary warnings, I think there are six, are, are not written to try and convince these recipients that they have sinned and lost their salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying what, what's the problem is that you really need to get saved. If you can read this letter and come away with that, then in my mind what's happened is that you have misinterpreted this passage because that's not what the author is doing. He's really writing Christians who are in very difficult circumstances to encourage them to go on in their faith, to proceed in their faith. And so from a, I think from an expositional perspective that it's absolutely critical to affirm 
that eternal security is a foundational doctrine of Scripture. And if that issue is not settled and acknowledged, then every time you come to a passage, every time that you come to one of the warnings and it uses the word if and it kind of gives the impression that somebody can lose their salvation, then the next thing that you know is that you're going to be thinking that you can lose your salvation or that you're not saved. That's not his purpose. That's not his purpose. He's giving them warnings. He's presenting the person of Christ and he's giving them warnings for not taking him seriously. And that happens and that can happen to anybody, to any Christian, in any church at any time. And so if that issue is not settled and acknowledged, then every time that these very strong warnings are presented, the misinformed believer will find themselves analyzing, questioning whether or not they're lost. You know, have I done some sin in my life that I shouldn't have done? And they're all the time be questioning, be questioning their, their salvation. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we'll take up here. In our, in our next session uh, here at the bottom of page 5. Thank you.